Hello and welcome to a proper UFC chat. I'm Dave Billhouse. I got Mason with me. I got Joe with me. We're doing UFC 299. This is a banger card. Uh, you'll definitely want to watch this. Uh, first up, John Wood, Marina Moroz. Uh, originally thought I'd be on Moroz, but I just can't. Uh, can't pull the trigger on it. I find her just a little bit too low volume, and her accuracy is pretty brutal. Uh, Joanne Wood's striking is fairly decent. She's plus 2.2 strikes a minute on her opponents, landing 51%, and Moroz is like a 31% accuracy with landing almost three strikes a minute less. So, so I hate to say it, I, I think Wood's a fairly live dog, even though I think she sucks, kind of. She's super old, like she's older than me. Pretty easy pass. Um, Mace, how do you feel about this one? Yeah, uh, right there with you on the easy pass. We have two of the best fades going head-to-head -head with already announcing that this is your retirement fight for Joanne Wood and having an OnlyFans with Myra Moroz. So I'm not sure which uh, fade is going to win out, but I this is not something I want to put money on with a ton of other really great fights. So easy, uh, easy pass for me. Yeah, I'm with you guys. I think the line's about accurate. I think Moros wins, but I think it's about the same. Like I, I, I'd line her at like minus two hundred, minus two twenty five, which is where she's at. So pass. Okay, that's uh, that is fair to say. Uh, next up, uh, Asu. Oh, sorry, Joe, you're up next. Thank God, I don't know how to say this. Go. For it. <laughs> CJ Vergara taking on Azu Almabayev. Some Thank Almabayev. You. Yeah. I thought I had it when you were about to pronounce it. I'm like, I got this. And then all of a sudden you passed me and I like my brain just like exploded. Um, this this yeah. dude got steamed, man, from minus 142 to minus 550. Like, what the hell kind of move is that off a soft opener? I saw him last week at like minus 350 and I liked it. But now he's at minus 575 on DraftKings. It's hard to get there. Like Vigara is a tough dude, constantly moves forward. He's one of those guys where I feel like if it's a dog fight, he might be able to get something done at the same time. I'm a buy of one of those guys where he gets on top. He has great positioning, um, good wrestling, uh, good jujitsu. Showed that against Ode Osborne. And I think Ode Osborne's a tougher fight than Vegara. Uh, like, I, I rate him higher than Vegara. So I think it's almost a step down for Alma Baev. Um, I think he wins at a high clip. I just don't know if I can get there um, at the current line. I was going to bet earlier this week, him in a parlay with another fighter we'll talk about uh, very later. Um, but now, uh, I don't know. It's, it's tough to get there. Yeah, it's tough to get there, but he's it's, he's going to win, I think. I think Vergara kind of just isn't really on that level. Um, I mean, seeing him have to run away from Daniel Lacerda <laughs> or gas himself out, I mean, that's a tough look. Because Lacerda is proving to be, like, although exciting, uh, just a massive bust. Um, yeah, and I kind of thought he lost to Clayton Rodriguez, too, so... Yikes. Um, I can't I don't can't necessarily get there, but it's pretty easy favorite or pass, I would say. Um yeah, I I don't know. Mace, how do you feel? Yeah, I mean, right there with y'all. Asu's been I mean, he he's definitely fought some kind of cans in his come up, but he's also fought some really good guys too. Uh his win over Alan Carr, I think's nice. One of his two losses was against Tagiru and Bekov. Like, it, definitely you can't say he, like, was only fighting frauds and stuff like that up to this point. Um, beating Ode Osborne should mean you can beat CJ Vergara, but we're touching, like, minus 600 now. So, if uh, making a pick to win, odds don't matter. Asu, easy call. Putting money down on it, definitely quite a bit tougher. But, uh, yeah, I like Asu's chances quite a bit, to be fair. I don't think CJ Vegara is very highly rated in my mind. Um, the one thing he does have going for him, despite the fact we all watched him run for 20 seconds, is outside of that, he is normally coming forward and fighting at a higher pace. So uh, I just think he's going to be there, but Asu's – Going to kind of welcome that and hit him with some clean stuff. So, favorite or pass for the, for the whole squad again. 
Uh, next, Josh Parisian, Robles, Despionage. Uh, I've taken pisses longer than Ro- Robles' entire professional MMA career. Like This guy is three-second, four-second, seven-second wins. It's insane. He looks like an absolute freak. Um, like this is you build a creative fighter, maxed out all the like height, weight, reach sort of sliders, and you now have this absolute monster. But that being said, like kind of hard to trust him. Never seen anything from him at all. Like what what happens if a fight lasts ninety seconds? Is he dead? Is he can he breathe still? Never seen him get taken down. I mean, Josh Parisian is. I, I'm not sure there's a price tag you can put on him that I'm going to bet on. And like, he's not good. Uh, but the one spot of his game where he does look the best is when he's on top in a grappling situation. And I got no worldly idea what's going to look like if uh, Rebellus is on his back. So for sure, not betting Parisian, but I, I don't think I want to sign up for a guy with, 25 seconds of fight time in his pro career more than likely just absolutely deads josh with like the first 30 seconds the first one or two things he touches him with uh he can punch him standing inside the cage while parisians walking out his arms are so long so more than likely he's gonna get a violent early finish but like it's just so hard to try to trust him i'm on Kind of the same boat as Mason, but I'm actually probably going to be betting uh, Robellis here. Um, reason being, I agree with everything Mason said. We haven't seen his takedown defense. We, he's probably going to look like shove his back. Let's be honest. He's 35, comes from a karate background. How many takedowns does he possibly face? But at the same time, I don't think Parisian's one of those guys that's a really technical wrestler. He's one of those guys where to get in, he has to like kind of come in, arms wide, and clinch you, and then hopefully get a takedown. But I think by the time he does that, he's eating five or six shots by this guy with 90-inch arms or something crazy. So... Um, I do like, uh, Robellis here. Um, like you said, Parisian gets him down and the fight gets extended. I like him, but at the same time, not like him, but I, I can see how this fight becomes challenging. But at the same time, Parisian got outstruck by Roque Martinez. And that was a bad split decision loss. If Roque Martinez is out striking you and he's like 5'10", I really think this guy with a karate background in his debut, they're lining him up here for a reason. He's 4-0. I feel like he's sp- like sped rushed into some exciting fights. He's already 35. The UFC knows that what they have in him. And then they're giving him a few highlight reel KOs on these bigger cards and all of a sudden try and match him up with like a zero gone or something. Um, yeah, I'm not saying he's as good as gone, but I feel like he's at least exciting and the heavyweights kind of need something like a spark to get the division jumping again. So probably going to parlay him. I get why people are hesitant on it. I would just be shocked if Parisian's the guy. Yeah, I uh... I like Robellus quite a bit here. I know there's all the things like the experience and what's he look like on his back, but Josh Prezian's wrestling is not very good. Um, he's a very poor striker. He's slow. Very big. Um, and his footwork stinks. He doesn't really move his head. He's a pretty stationary target. I mean, what's he going to do to close the distance on this guy? He's going to get his head caved in on the way in. Um. Yeah, I think Robellus knocks him out. Looks pretty good doing it. Um, Josh Prezen just I don't know. It's just I don't want to be mean, but he doesn't really do anything well. You know, he's just kind of like determination. Um, and when you can be a professional UFC fighter on determination alone, like you got to give the guy a shitload of credit. I just I don't know. He does take this down. Is he going to be able to keep him there? Maybe. Maybe not. This guy looks like a bit of a freak athlete. I don't know if Josh is strong enough. He might not be. Um, and what does Josh look like if he can't get a takedown after one round? I, I'd have to imagine this guy can fight for at least five, six minutes before getting tired. And also the footwork difference is going to be incredible. Like, I know Parisian's going to have the grappling edge, but in order to get the grappling edge, he has to grab him. And I don't think he's going to be able to get a hold of the guy yeah. who has so much better footwork. Like, it's not even close. Yeah, he'll dance me outside if it gets to that point. I think. I mean, if we look at everyone, Josh looks like he's in shape. Spots, there's really nobody um, who can we compare those to. This guy beat Alan Bado because Bado was just so bad he couldn't and stop the takedown. But Bado's but also smaller than him and way smaller. Like, 
not as good of a striker either. Um, I'm just looking through this and like, I don't know. I, I think this very well could be the hardest fight Parisians ever had. Mm-hmm. I mean, it probably is. So Parker Porter would like a word. Maybe Jamal Pogues. Parker Porter, like decent, but I think Robel's probably kick his head into the upper deck. So, uh, yeah, give me the favorite. Uh, I know that's a fairly square opinion. I just, I don't know. I look at the size of this guy. He's a good striker, an Olympic level striker. He, he's going to have no trouble with one of the worst strikers of ever seen. Yeah. Next I mean, up, it, it is a fight. Oh, sorry. I was just saying, like, end of the day, it is a fight. Picking the dude who looks like he was genetically built to fuck it, people up, probably <laughs> a good idea. Yeah. It's, not the, it's not the end of the world if he loses, but he just. How do you fade this guy with Josh Parisian? You can't even consider it. <clears throat> um, Michelle Pereira, Lord Michael Oleg Zajac. Uh, what a fight this will be. I think we're all over the map on this one. I think uh, my opinion is kind of, I, I don't mind Lord Michael. I, he's a better boxer. He doesn't do a lot of kicking. We know that. And Pereira does kick nice and move nice. Um I don't know. I just feel like oh, uh, Michael's going to be able to dig to the body, get his combinations going. Someone's probably going to get hurt. It probably goes under. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't decide how this is going to play out. So for now I'm passing unless Joe or Mason can talk me into a side. It's going to be tough because Joe and I are on opposite sides for this one. Uh, I'm there right with you with Ole's A check. I get See the first round definitely being difficult, but Pereira slows down. He has in all of his fights, even after the weight change and the cooling down on the backflips and pre-fight annex, he still slows down and starts losing bits of that horizontal movement that he's really good at. And old Zaychek will be right there chasing him down in the pocket uh, as long as this fight's going to go. He rips the body really well with his uh, combinations, which I think will just continue to accelerate sucking down the gas tank of Pereira. Um, and yeah, I think he really starts pouring it on as this fight progresses. As long as he doesn't get killed in the first five, seven and a half minutes, I think he really takes over and is honestly live for like a round three KO as Pereira's uh, gassing out. So I think, uh, just super crisp boxing, really great body shots. Give me the, give me old Zaychek who uh, just, I don't know. I think he's going to track him down, be right in his face, and just keep hitting him, hitting him, hitting him, and Pereira is going to eventually fold. Yeah, I'm on Pereira. I'm on the other side here. Um, the reason, well, to start off, it's funny. The two, I always get some fighters, like some fighters always, like I get confused, and the two I get confused a lot are Oleg Zajuk and Ian Kutalaba. And they're on the same card, so it made it easy this time not to get my memory confused. But for some reason, mm-hmm. I always, like, I don't know if they look the same or what it is, but for some reason, I always get them kind of confused. And they've been in the UFC forever, so there's, like, no reason for it. But for the Oleg zajuk Pereira fight, the reason I like Pereira is I think his footwork's a lot better. I think he's quicker, faster. He's going to have a speed advantage early. Although Oleg Zajuk's going to be one probably pushing forward, I think that actually helps Pereira. Pereira gets in sometimes close fights where... Um, he just doesn't put out the volume. It's kind of sitting there dancing around the outside. But if a guy's pushing forward, I think it forces him to land more. Although his cardio, he's known to have bad cardio. But that was back in the Tristan Connolly fight. That was like four or five years ago. I think it's getting better. Um, and that fight's super embarrassing, even looking back on it. Like, there's no reason he should have lost that fight. Um, but since then, he's a guy that also fights close. So I, I going into research, I like Pura more than I did coming out of it. But I still think he should get the nod here. Um, Olesechuk can maybe cause him problems or gets a hold of him and just kind of slows down the rounds. But if it stays standing from the outside, I think Pereira is going to kind of have a field day. Um, Dustin Jacoby made it look pretty easy. I think Pereira just offers him a bit more even than Jacoby. Um, you know, Jacoby's bigger than Pereira. I think Pereira's even big at this weight class. Um, you know, he's going up in weight, which is kind of kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a clo- Like, this is another fight where... I wouldn't shock if someone comes down to a split because Pereira always fights close, but I just think that he's probably the side. Um, I also do like the under. I, I wouldn't be shocked if it, it, like, I think both guys have finishing upside. Like Mason said, we'll say Chuck late, maybe be a sub if Pereira gets down and you know, scrambles poorly, but I think Pereira can also finish him on the feet pretty easily. 
Um, so the under and Pereira are the two sides I'm looking at. Um, on to the next fight, we got Philip Linz taking on Ian Kutalaba. The other guy I get confused all the time. So this line's kind of shocking to me, and I see people on the other side than I am on. I, I like Ian Kutalaba in this fight quite a bit here. I know Kutalaba is notorious for bad gas tank, but I think this is a good matchup for him. Linz is, one, is a guy who doesn't put out a ton of volume. I know he's on a decent fight win streak, but I think Kutalaba smokes all the guys he's beaten. Um, and I think this is kind of a step back from some of the guys Kutalaba's faced, fighting guys like Ankalaev, Roundtree, Glover Teixeira, Ryan Spann, Johnny Walker, even Kennedy and, and Jacques Quanu, who he lost to. Kennedy's so much yeah. bigger than Philip Linz and Kutalaba. Kutalaba and Linz are roughly the same size. Um, I think Kutalaba's on a massive size advantage. Another thing people aren't taking into account, I feel like, is Linz is 38 now. Um, I know he's only been in the UFC. I think this is his fourth or fifth UFC fight. And before that, he was in PFL. 38's old, man. Um, and getting old for light heavyweight. He's, he's not going to be making improvements while well. Kutalaba's just turned 30. And he's been in the UFC for, I don't know, feels like forever. Like, I think like eight years, maybe. Um, so Kutalaba's making improvements. Linz is getting worse. We're getting having a chance to get Kutalaba at minus 125, where I feel like it's a speed advantage. And although if he, if Linz pushes the pace somehow miraculously this fight, Kutalaba can gas on it. Like I can see outcomes where Linz gets it done. But I feel like um, I'm probably betting Kutalaba pretty big here. I feel like it's a good matchup for him. And he has all the physical tools besides gas tank in this fight, where I feel like it's not going to play as big of a factor in this one as it normally would for a Kutalaba fight. Yeah, I like Kutalaba a lot too. Um I realize uh, Felipe Linz has never been taken down in the UFC, but I don't really think he's faced any serious takedown threats. Um, he hasn't like faced him besides maybe like Bozer, who can take Bozer tried. Down. I can't even remember. No, he Bozer didn't tried, even but try. I'm saying like he hasn't fought anyone who's like <laughs> yeah. a wrestler. I don't think Bozer's. No, yeah, not at all. All strikers. Um, I, I've seen Felipe kind of pack up when things get tough too, like he did with Bozer. And Kutalaba is going to be in his face. He's going to make things tough. So, um, yeah, I feel like Kutalaba, major wrestling upside. Plus, he's just crazy. Like, um, you can exchange with him. He can out wrestle him for sure. He might get tired, but um, that's what the live lines. Yeah, and Kutalaba will win round one at like I make it like a really high clip. Um, so if you want to take Lens, like you might as well do it live. You're going to get a way better line. Um, if he's still alive after him, if Lava gets on top, I mean, have mercy, right? Like, you never know what could happen there. It'd be game over. Uh, and I suspect he will get on top and, and yeah, win round one at a really high clip, probably get a finish somewhere in this fight. Uh, minus 125 just is so low. I don't really understand it. Um, and maybe it is because he's, because he lost like eight of his last nine fights, but like, yeah, it, it's a way, way higher level of competition. Ankle eye up twice. Jacoby, picked Jacoby down nine times. Um, Yeah, give me Eon and one of my more confident picks, like as far as like a pick em type thing goes. This is, uh, feels like a great line, great buy low spot to fade a 38-year-old that doesn't really hit that hard. What do you think, Mace? Yeah, I mean, Kudalaba definition of a shit eating wild man that dude is psycho um my big concern with him is less on the cardio side and more on the fight iq makes a lot of really dumb decisions a lot of times in the cage uh that kennedy and jeku fight he rocked him so hard right at the start and kennedy was wobbled and he just grabs his hips and starts going for a takedown when there's probably one to two strikes away from finishing it. And then, I don't know, 20 seconds go by and he gets deaded from a shot from Kennedy. <laughs> like, real bad IQ and fighting up against a lot of uh, alleged steroid use with lens. So, sure, something mm -hmm. might happen. But, I mean, if you're getting knocked out by Tanner Bozer, I think you are one overhand away from Kudalaba, and it's going to be like a Sopage-level knockout where you're not getting up for a long time. So, yeah, I think Lynn's definitely a good – I mean, Kudalaba definitely a good look. Uh, my, both my books pulled the total for this fight. Uh, it's locked up 
because I would also really like the under one and a half. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably going to be pretty chalked, but it's definitely something else I'd be looking at as well as uh, if you didn't want to just take the good old opposite. You don't have a total for it either, but um, my only concern there is Linz isn't super aggressive either. Like yeah, if there's a lot of gases, I want to be shot to be let some, you know, fight to a decision, gassed. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Next, we got Pedro Munoz versus Kyler Phillips. Um, it's kind of a tough fight to get a good read on, in my opinion. Lines may be a little bit wide, but at the same time, I think Pedro's maybe like he's kind of stalling out towards the tail end of his career here. Uh, Kyler Phillips post USADA world's probably going to be feeling pretty good, but uh, I mean, Pedro's a really durable guy. Never seen him be finished. And I mean, been fighting just a lot of the top level dudes for years and years straight now. Um, whoever you do like, I think you should take him by decision. I got a strong feeling this is going to go to the scorecards, which I know crazy feeling with an over two and a half being minus 300 plus. But I think uh, regardless of who you want, you can get a little better juice for the squeeze by taking them by decision. But I, I really don't have a strong feel on uh, picking a side for the winner for this one. Yeah, I I feel like it has to be dog or pass. Um I'm not sure I can get there on Munoz, though, because it's another fighter where he's 37, he's getting old, and 37 at um, Bantamweight is really old. He's starting to lose a step a little bit, coming off a few losses. But at the same time, Phillips is a step down from the guys he's facing. Like he's His last fight was in Chito Vera. He's beat Chris Gutierrez in a similar situation where Gutierrez was supposed to kind of go over him and um, you know be the younger fighter. But um, you're fighting guys like Sean O'Malley, Dominic Cruz, Jose Aldo, Frankie Edgar, and now fighting Kyler Phillips. I think Phillips is a good prospect. He's 28. He has some upside, but I feel like he leaves a little bit to be desired. Um, I thought he lost his last out against Ron Ronnie Barcelos. Um, he won the decision, but I thought he lost that fight. It was a close decision that he won unanimously, but I was on the other side of that. Um, and I'm kind of Mason. This is hard to be confident in either way in. Um, I'm not saying I, I think Munoz wins the fight. I probably lean Phillips. I think he should be like minus one, you know, one minus one forty, minus one fifty, not minus two hundred. Um, he probably wants to fight like sixty percent of the time, um, whereas the lines have him at like seventy, you know, sixty-five, seventy. So for me, it's Munoz or pass. Probably passing just because there's so many question marks around Munoz, but it wouldn't be sh wouldn't shock me if I get there on on Munoz. Yeah, it's a tough one. I, I kind of like Phillips. I just think he's a better minute winner. Um, he gets hit a little bit less than Munoz. Munoz kind of just, I don't know. He, he has trouble closing the distance sometimes, and he just wants to fire leg kicks, um, which could really change the fight for sure. But I don't know. I, wrestling upside uh, is definitely with Phillips. I don't know if he'll be able to get it to the mat too easily, but um, I don't know. I just like the way he bounces around and kind of, you know, it's going to touch you a little bit more than you're going to get touched is how it feels. But, um, yeah, the line is it's not very inviting, which is probably more of a reason to think it's going to happen. But, um, yeah, I mean, for me right now, it's a pass. Um, and that takes us to uh, Gamrod and Dos Nachos. Uh, Rafael Dos Andros, man, this guy. He's just a little bit too old for my, like, Christ, we're talking 40 years old this year. What are you doing at 155, 40 years old? Um, seems like a pretty good spot for Gamron. Dos Andros, uh, he does not have good takedown defense. 56% over his career. Gives up way too many. He's been in some wars. I mean, I just I don't feel like this is a great spot for him, but it's, again, hard to want to bet uh, Gamron at prices like this. I don't know. I mean... Fights where he doesn't have a wrestling advantage or can't get his wrestling going, he's getting smoked. You know, Covington, Usman, Edwards, he couldn't take down. Uh, Michael Chiesa had no trouble with him because he had the wrestling advantage. You know what I'm saying? So, like, Vicente Luque took him down eight times, which I could not believe my eyes. 
Um, so I have to imagine Gamera just, you know, rinse and repeat takedowns. He's not a great striker, but he's it's going to be faster. It's going to have a uh, it's going to have wrestling advantage. And like I said, Dos Anjos isn't too good when he doesn't have the wrestling advantage these days. He's he's old. So uh, give me Gamera. Yeah, I'm with you there. Uh, a little nervous. Check in like the handle for this fight. Well over ninety percent of everything's being placed on Gamrot, but I mean that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I I would assume he's gonna get. Well, I guess it depends on Dos Anjos' get up game, but I think he's gonna get a takedown each round. I wouldn't be shocked if he gets like seven or eight if RDA finds his way to get back up to the feet. But just younger, stronger, quicker guy who's going to be tenacious and attempting to wrestling. Really think uh, it all kind of leans Gamrot. Feels feels like it should be a pretty safe parlay piece. Um, kind of curious to see what Gamrot by decision line is going to be because I like Dos Anjos's defensive BJJ did not get finished, and uh, I just don't think Gamrot's really going to be fishing for stuff like that. He'll have a lot of position, get some damage off, and then just get it right back to the mat. So Gamrot for me too. Yeah, I think Gamrot wins. I just think the line's kind of crazy. Like I think it's probably dog or pass, but I'm not rushing about the dog here either. I think Gamrot wins at a high clip, but I at minus four seventy now and the line keeps climbing. It's kind of tough. Um I feel like this is a fight that could play out close. Like um I think Gamrot has the advantage of everybody. He doesn't always put a stamp on rounds and RDA is one who kind of is similar. So I'm shopping if somehow this is like a split decision game right win or something crazy where you're kind of like get a takedown, get a takedown. He scrambles up and you're like, fuck, get another takedown, get another takedown. Like, you know what I mean? They both don't like hold positions as well as they used to, or RDA doesn't hold positions as well as they used to. Gamrot just kind of always forces crazy scrambles. Um, Yeah. Not too much to add here. Um, Gamrot or pass. On the next fight, we got Kate, Caitlin Jukagan. I'm, I'm not even going to pronounce her by her new last name. I even don't pronounce it, and she's always been Jukagan to me. Uh, versus Macy, the future barber. Um, I do like Barber in this fight, but I'm not confident. I feel like this is another fight where it's probably a split decision. Like, you could bet split decision props on this one. It's probably the one to do it on. Jukagan's going to look better standing. Barber, like she's Caitlin Jukagan's going to win with volume. Barber's going to have the grappling upside and probably the more power. Um, but neither fight and put stamps in any rounds. Um, I, how many split decisions do they both have? Like, I think Barber probably has at least two or three off the top of my head, and Chicago probably has two or three off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, this is me one that I'm not super excited. And Barber's obviously improving every fight. She's 25. Jukagan's probably getting worse at 35. Barber has a grappling upside, striking maybe close because she has a power. Chicago has a, volume but i'm not rushing about it either for me it's an all-around pass but my favorite pass i'm not loving it i like the over i mean it's gonna hit a, i think it's more like a minus 700 type line so it's nothing really to get into chuke doesn't really have power but she's got good forward she can stay on the outside and that's that's gonna make it tough for barbara to find a finish um yeah that's it like the over. How about you, Mace? Uh, I like Barber quite a bit in this one, which is surprising. I've kind of been a uh, Macy Barber hater in the past, but I want to choose my words carefully on this too. Um, Caitlin just gave an interview yesterday explaining her layoff for the last year plus and why she hasn't been around. She's been going through, I mean, she got married. But she also has been getting uh, fertility treatments, underwent three separate rounds of IVF. She said herself she had two different miscarriages during that time. Oh, and sad. I mean, that's that's awful. Really, like just from like a human perspective, feel really bad for that. But as a, if you want to be like an objective third party, to me, Caitlin is looking at life far outside of fighting right now. She's gotten married, looking at having kids, is 35, kind of on the tail end of the career, 
just went through a real tough stretch on her body with different hormones and different things that are associated with that. And for sure wasn't training during two shortened pregnancies. So I think at bare minimum, she has to have one foot in the retirement grave. And uh, I just, Macy's the kind of girl that's going to get in your face, hit you with something hard, and it'll be like, fuck this. I, I don't need this anymore. So I, I really think Barber, either through grappling or just landing clear shots, even if she's getting outlanded two or three to one, because Macy loves throwing <laughs> a bunch of airstrikes from 10 feet across the cage. But I think she can be just getting outlanded the whole round and then hit her with one solid combination, kind of wobble her, get some damage going and steal it that way. So hitting Barber at only two to one, I think uh, it's actually a really good price for her in a fight that I'm quite confident she's going to be able to win. Another thing to add to real quick before you hop to the next fight, uh, line's not out yet, and I'm sure it's going to be super juiced, but I still like it as Macy Barber finishes only. I know we all agree it's probably most likely to go to decision, but Chukagan hasn't had a finish in the UFC ever, and her last finish is in 2016, the amateur scene, where Barber, though she's not one to go out and you know get a ton of finishes, but she's at least like 50-50 in fights. She gets finishes in. She's way more nasty on the ground than Chukagan. If she gets top position, gets mount or something, I can see her finishing with some ground and pound. Um, not super likely. I all right. Up next, we got one of the uh, probably more hotly contested fights with Jailton Almeida and Curtis Blades. Uh, really kind of pick your poison, basically a PK line. I am in the Almeida camp. Uh, I have made it a business of losing money with Curtis Blades in the past. Not, uh, not getting sucked into the trap here at this line. Um, I get it that he's supposed to be the best wrestler in the heavyweight division. He's definitely quite a bit bigger and larger than Jailton. Uh, and more than likely, probably the better striker of the two. But I have yet to see Jailton look like a human in the UFC. This man has not really had any pushback. And I think it's he's just really that good. Um, so much quicker very strong. Anyone who thinks he's not going to be able to take Blades down, go watch some of these takedowns Blades has given up in his career. Sloppy, slow, just like bad position. I think Jailton honestly ragdolls him and uh, kind of embarrasses Blades here. Blades, it's been three or four years since he's even attempted a takedown in his last handful of fights. I'm um, sure if he catches him like Dawkins, maybe Jailton gets rocked. Don't really know what his chin looks like. Thought we'd maybe learn that in the Derek Lewis fight. Didn't have to because he was not in uh, a bad position for even a second in that fight. So I think Jailton uh, continues his climb up the heavyweight ranks. And I mean, I don't even, I don't even really think this is going to be that difficult of a fight for him. Uh, Curtis Blades, probably a future PFL champ. Hope hope the best for him because he's been the like perennial, always the bridesmaid, never the bride for this heavyweight division. I was like for six years now, he's supposed to be like the next title guy, the next one, the next one. And uh, I think it's time to admit it's not happening. And Jailton just feasts on him here this Saturday. Yeah, I also lean Almeida, but... Um... Not as, I guess, convinced on how it's going to play out. Like, a lot of times the two wrestlers fight each other, it usually becomes a striking fight. I feel like on the feet, it's going to be close. Um, I do think, a lot of people think Blades is a better striker, but I think Almeida actually might have the striking edge. I think I'm on, I'm on an island there. Um, we'll see on Saturday. But that's kind of one of the reasons I lean Almeida. The other reason is, is, like you said, Blades does give up takedowns at times. And I feel like Blades hasn't been shooting for as many takedowns early as Almeida has. So if someone's going to shoot, I feel like it may be Almeida early and whoever shoots first may end up getting that round um, or at least forcing a scramble. Um, so just based off aggressiveness, I, I think Almeida, I think he also has a Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu upside in this fight over um, Blades. You think? Um, huh. Yeah, like he should. And the other line I like a lot that hasn't 
dropped yet, but I'm waiting for it. I think it's going to play out closer. Is Almeida finishes only? Like even if that minus two hundred, I think I like it because I think he's a lot more likely to get the finish than Blades. Um, just because Blades' chin's probably worse, Almeida is a better jujitsu on the feet. I think that's probably going to go to decision actually, which is kind of strange for a heavyweight fight. I think there's kind of play patty cake from the outside. Is how I actually see the fight going, but if there's a finish, I think it's Almeida. Um, I lean Almeida in this fight, and I like him finishes only. Hmm. Wow, I, I kind of like the under one and a half, a plus one fifteen. I think um, like on the feet, either guy could score a knockout pretty quick. Um, and I think if it gets to the mat, it's going to get real interesting. Um, even if Blades is on top, I think he's you know at risk to get swept, um, but he could definitely do some damage on top. And if he's the one on bottom, I think he's going to be finished. So. Um, have to lean Almeida because there's two things I noticed with these two fighters and they're polar opposites. And the thing is, Curtis Blades cannot take the path of least resistance. His ego will not let him. It's just, it's so disappointing. He's flushed so much of my money down the toilet. I've had him ranked number one in heavyweight for like the last five years and the fucking guy can't even beat Derek Lewis who can't stop a takedown. I mean, look at Daniel Cormier fighting Derek Lewis. How easy was that? Go grab a single leg, sit him down, and get your title defense. But no, Blades is like, fuck it, I'm a kickboxer against King Kong. Like, and if he fucks around here, it's just it's just minus EV. And then on the other side, Jalton, this guy fights a perfect game plan every time. He doesn't fuck around. He knows what he's good at, and he doesn't give a shit. If people are like, well, all you can do is wrestle. He doesn't give a shit. He just goes and takes the path of least resistance. He does this thing, so I can't bet on Curtis Blades anymore. It's like I need to go to like an AA meeting for it. Dude, I stay away from that. Just like bad that. for my health. I'll never What's forget that? playing over minus three hundred on him when he just got that uppercut from hell from Lewis, yeah. and, and it wasn't and a small amount either. You know, like it's just so sickening watching this shit happen to a guy that easily could have won a title and kept it. Could have kept it for a long time. But he just doesn't want to. It's just anyway. Um, so I have to lean Almeida, but it is a dangerous fight. Um, like most heavyweight fights are. This one is fairly evenly matched, but I as I know, Blades is not gonna shoot a takedown in the first round. He probably won't. I mean, how can you make him a favorite? I I don't really know how you can. And and as far as a jujitsu advantage goes, I I don't I think that's like a silly word like I think it's like over it's not an advantage it's like a full blown 100% you're fucking dead if it's in grappling right you'll choke that guy's head off no problem he'll advance position no problem if he's on top so give me Almeida um I can't say I'm like super excited about it but you know give me Almeida um next up this is um Another fun one here. Peter Yan, Song Yudong, probably fight of the night. These guys are going to fucking kick the shit out of each other. What a great buy low spot on Peter Yan, except like it's not an easy fight. Song's a little younger. I think he hits maybe a little bit harder, but um, ultimately these guys are kind of clones of each other, right? Like, I don't know. Yan's right in his prime. This poor guy is like, most people thought he was the best in the division. For a long time until I guess just recently. He's lost four of his last five. Um, mind you, he kind of beat Sean O'Malley, most people say. <clears throat> so I I don't really know what to say. This one's just such a damn banger. Um, it probably goes the distance, but that's also scary to bet on when guys are trading. So um I don't yeah, I might as well not even have spoke. This is a really tough fight. Kind of lean the over. Um yeah, I can't I can't be confident on a side. It's just like if you want to bet on song, you're I feel like you're paying, you know, because he's been performing and Jan hasn't, so you know you're getting a discount technically there. And I think if this was a couple of years ago, Jan would be like minus four hundred. Would that be correct? I don't know, but you know what I mean. So I'll just let Mason start talking since I don't know how to make sense. Yeah, I really 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 like peter yan here like i think my favorite spot of the whole card 
uh, may and eh, Jailton maybe, but song, fun fighter, exciting guy. I don't really have like negative things to say about him, but this is just, I think, a criminal overreaction to the last handful of fights for Jan. And uh, you could even say that they're in a different world. The, the outcomes would have been different in about half of those bad fights as well. Um, absolutely dominating Aljo the first time around before the illegal knee. Real gritty fight after that. I mean, I'm happy O'Malley won the decision. We had like a plus 500 ticket on that. But that's almost a little more like reading the tea leaves of what's going on in the UFC. Not necessarily, oh, he like lost the fight. Um. Yeah, I I think he really gets back in a big way on Saturday. Song, um, like I said, very exciting, but definitely more hittable. I think Jan's striking defense is a lot better. Uh, I think he's gonna mix it up between head, body, and legs a lot better. Um, and he he's not old. He's like thirty one. Uh, it feels like Jan should be much older than what he is, but. He's not, and sure, he gave up, what was that, like 12, 15 takedowns to Marab. But what no one ever I hear get say is he stopped 40-plus of them, too. Like, it's just who was going to think that Marab was going to shoot 55 fucking takedowns? Like, that's just wild. Song is not going to be wrestling like that. And in all honesty, I think Peter probably, uh, if he wants to, would have the grappling and wrestling success in this fight. So I, I'm going to be going pretty big on Jan. Definitely one of my favorite spots on the card. And it's kind of one of those, like, I think, I think y'all must have forgot the one and four in the last five sounds bad, but like go back and dig through it. That's still better than Song Yudong knocking out Julio Arce a couple years ago. Uh, or even like the decision winning against Chris Gutierrez, like, Peter Yan would fucking destroy Juicy J and stuff like that. So this, if he didn't lose the couple of splits, I think he's easily minus three fifty in this spot. So give me Yan at minus one twenty all day long. Uh, I do think it's a good buy low spot on Yan, but I'm not nearly as convinced as you all are. Um, reasons being, I think Yan's a, a slow starter. Um, he seems to give up the first round, and then he's got to win rounds two and three. I also think they're kind of like Dave said, they're kind of clones of each other. They both have very similar styles. And if Song has more volume, that might give him at least round one. And then after that, it's 50-50. And Jan does have a tendency to kind of fight close and not put stamps on rounds. And I do think Song hits a lot harder. Um, and saying I think Jan's more technical almost everywhere. I think he has a grappling upside. But at the same time, Song Yudong uh, fights that team alpha male. They usually have good takedown defense. I don't expect this to be too much of a grappling fight. Um, I expect this more to be a... Um, just a, pretty much a boxing Box. fight with some leg kicks mixed in there. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a close fight. I think Jan probably wins. Um, another battle like, which is kind of contradicting this, is Song Yudong finishes only. As crazy as that sounds, I think he has he's more likely to finish over Jan than Jan is to finish Song Yudong. Both guys, though, tough as nails. I probably think it goes over. Um, yeah, this will be a great fight either way, no matter how it goes. Um, I'm, I'm not as convinced as Mason is, but like Mason did say, though, I do think this fight happened a year ago. Jan, even before the the Marab fight this happens, is he's what probably two minus two fifty, you know? Well, he was minus um, two hundred over Marab, so he's got to be at least that over Yudong. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, on to the next fight, we got Gilbert Burns taking on Jack Della Maddalena. This is a fight that I'm super excited to watch and super excited to break down because I think I put in some decent work on this one and hopefully it pays off, and it's not going to be the most exciting outcome. So going in, I like Gilbert Burns simply because off memory, Jack Della Maddalena cannot stop a takedown. His ground game is awful. We saw him against Basel Fazeev getting taken down 100 times off the top of my head. As long as Gilbert Burns lands a few takedowns, he wins rounds easily and can easily get a sub if he gets in the same positions that um, Jack Della goes for. After reviewing it, a lot of the takedowns Fazeev got were because Jack Della Maddalena was a moron and would try and shoot, like get guillotines and put himself in bad positions. Um, and if he does against Burns, he lost, and that's just on his fight IQ. Um, but also, Gilbert Burns, he just doesn't have very good striking defense. Um, I watched a key fight to go back and watch is a Kamaru Usman fight. 
He looked good early, and there's one jab where Burns Iglesias' eyes like light up like you saw a fucking ghost. And I know Usman was a champion. He has decent striking, but Jack Della made Atlanta striking, and his jab is a lot better than Usman's jab. Um, I now lean Jack Della Madalena. At this line, it's unplayable, though, because I think it could be, like, I lean, lean Jack Della at, like, 55%. I think he should be, like, minus 140. And minus 166, I can't play him. I think maybe value on Burns at plus 140 now, but I'm not betting him either because I think he probably loses. Um, one line I really love is Burns and Della, Mad- uh, Della Maddalena under two and a half. Um, when one guy's a superior grappler with submission upside, and like Burns, and the other guy has finishing upside in the feet, like who's super aggressive, like Della Maddalena, I think under two and a half is pretty safe. I would be, it also wouldn't shock me if even under one and a half happens. Della Maddalena comes out firing a lot of times in round one. Um, and Burns, after seeing how he took that first jab from Usman, kind of quit right after. Um, and he kind of did the same thing. If you go back and watch him even before he moved up weight classes, remember that, um, I think it was, was it Dan Hooker? Against it was Dan him? Hooker, who, who put him out in like 2018 and just in round one just kind of starched him and made him look real bad. Um, I, don't, I feel like he doesn't take damage very well. Um, so I really like under two and a half. And again, if Della Del Maddalena gets taken down and gets put in an arm triangle, it wouldn't shock me at all either. So Burns by sub, Maddalena by TKO, KO. I just think the under is safe. It's probably one of my bigger bets on the card. Yeah, this is it's kind of tough. Like, you, you guys broke it down fine. Um, but I agree with everything Joe said, basically. So I don't need to add much, but... Um, yeah, no, perfectly said. I like the under. I think Burns could sub him. I think Madalena could crack him. I also think Burns could crack Madalena. He he does hit pretty hard. We watched him go toe to toe with Chimaev, and he was throwing bombs. And uh, I don't know if Della Madalena has the same chin as Chimaev. We'll find out. But um, yeah, I don't know. In his nose. Well, his nose is well, still like fucking over here. He has to have some kind of chin. I hope. I saw someone say Jack looks west and his nose looks east. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's doing the no look, uh, no look striking. Yeah, get a uh, lean under. Um, that's it. I don't really have a breakdown. Nope, that's same for me. Love the under, same exact read. So we can uh, hop right into Kevin Holland and Michael Page. I. Despite not thinking it's maybe the smartest thing, really like Kevin Holland here. I think Michael Page is vastly overrated. I think he's old. I think he didn't fight a lot of great people in Bellator. Douglas Lee, I'm not saying like Douglas Lee is bad, but he didn't. Just the level of competition throughout his whole career has definitely been close, if not subpar. Um, I just, I don't know. Kevin Holland, the ultimate stunt puller, though, which is why it's really tough to want to get behind it. Like, if I lay a big bet on Kevin Holland and we get that dumb half afro bullshit going again, I'm fucked. Like, you just already know it in advance. But I I think Holland's got to be the side here. Like, I just don't see what this 37 year old Bellator fighter who. And correct me if I'm wrong, he wasn't just like UFC came to Bellator and like, we want him, we're going to sign him. Bellator parted ways with him. Like, they were done, if I'm not mistaken. I think his contract and, expired. Yeah, I, I I don't see Paige being super long for the UFC. Maybe he gets a couple of fun fights. A win here, sure, might vault him and uh, some like maybe top 15 matchups and stuff, but... I think he has bad matchups with a ton of guys in the division. His wrestling's not good. Logan Storley totally exposed the wrestling and win their fight. And, uh, I mean, yeah, Kevin Holland's not going to shoot a takedown. That'd be way too smart. But if he does, I think he absolutely schools Paige on the mat, chokes him out. Um, but, yeah, probably going to get a striking affair that goes um, probably the distance. But, I mean, Kevin Holland hits hard, fast, durable guy. Like, I really like Kevin Holland here. I'm just, oh, I've been burned by it before. Probably going to get ready to get burned again, but it's it's Holland for me. 
So I'm on the other side. I think I like Michael Venom Page here. Um, this kind of like if you're signing Michael Venom Page, I can't think of a better matchup for him than Kevin Holland in the UFC. If he faces a grappler, he's fucked. Like basically, instead of Holland grapples, he probably loses. But I think Holland's one of those guys that we is well known not to really follow a game plan. I think he actually kind of does the opposite. I think he wants to beat guys at where they're at their best. Like he grappled against Michael Chiesa, won by submission. Everyone else who's a good striker, he stands with them. And I feel like he's going to stand with Michael Venom Page. Um, and I do think this will be one of those fights where they both play from around from the outside. Holland talks his shit. Michael Venom Page calls him on, like does some Izzy spinning shit. And it's going to be one of those fights that's probably going to be like a back and forth. It's kind of exciting, but nothing really happens fight where we don't really know who wins by decision. Or I do like a line on Michael Venom Page, TKO, KO, and DQs only at minus 120. I think he's a lot more likely to finish Holland by strikes than Holland is to finish him. Holland's very uh, – his striking defense isn't very good. Page is way better defensively. Page probably hits harder, is faster. Um, Holland got cracked a few times even by Del Mat- uh, against Del Maddalena. Got hit a few times by Ponzinibbio even. Thompson beat him up. I know he broke his arm against Thompson, but even before that, it was a closer fight. And I feel like Page is a similar style but also bigger than Steven Thompson. Um, but regardless, this is going to be a sick fight. Um, I just feel like it's one of those situations where I faded Michael Chandler saying, saying the same things you did, Mason, when he debuted against Dan Hooker. He, Hooker's way bigger. Hooker is another striking advantage. All of a sudden, one run just dropped him. I'm like, well, UFC got a star. I feel like it's the same thing. Page is very marketable from the UK. Fight sick. Gets up a potential Izzy fight. Wants to go up and wait because Izzy said he wants to fight him down the road. And that'd be a sick fight where they both kind of do crazy, weird shit. Um, yeah, I just feel like Page money line small at plus money and KO TK was only I like that line too at minus 120. And it's not saying sub, sub's not in there by the way. So if sub happens, Holland executes a game plan, I it's a push, but um, KO TK TK is only I like Page. I guess I lean Holland. Um, you know, he's fought the better competition, he's younger, I think he hits a little bit harder. Um, but I I think he's a bit of an idiot. Uh, not interested in betting on this. These guys are just going to be chirping each other and dancing and kinds of weird shit. It'll be fun to watch, but I don't think I can tie my money to it on either side. Um, yeah, I, I don't think Michael Page is really that good. He's made a career off beating up hobos. He's had a couple of tough fights, but they're not really that tough. I don't, I don't really know how the top of Bellator would do against a top 15 UFC fighter. I don't think any of them would win. So um, this is one of them. You know, I have to lean Holland, wrestling upside younger. It's going to be close. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be weird. All it's a matchup things. mixed fight type of fight. Where yeah. You match up with other guys in the top 10. He's probably fucked up against Holland. I feel like Holland's and can play right into his tools. Yeah, it's a decent matchup. Um, I mean... Holland's got a great chin. He rocked Wonder Boy a few times. He deaded Ponzinibbio. Like, I just. But Page has been knocked out either. Page kind of sucks. I think he was, uh, did some funny shit with like the Pokemon ball and stuff like that. And people are like, oh, that was cool. He caved in a dude's forehead on a flying knee, which admittedly was fucking wild. But that shit's not going to fly in the UFC at all. Like, I I, th- I don't know. I think you're overlooking him a little bit. Like, my biggest concern with betting Page is his lack of volume. I think Holland's had more volume, but at the same time, like, I think Page is a faster striker, a better striking defense, and is a more diverse striker. Um, and Holland has gotten cracked in a few fights. I know he has a good chin, but he also did get put out by Kyle Dawkins on an ex- excellent headbutt. Like, no, that, yes, he got happened. he got knocked out by an illegal strike. Correct. <laughs> yeah. So it's not like Page can't put him out. And I know Page did get knocked out too by a crazy strike by Douglas Lima on like an uppercut when I got leg kicked. But like both of his chins are good. I probably lean the over, but if there is a finish, I think it's Page or a striking finish. I think it's Page. Let's be clear there. Subs obviously Holland. Sorry, this is the next one, Dave. I got sidetracked. Yeah, sure. Oh, me? Okay. Um, Dustin Poirier, Benoit Saint-Denis. Look it to my veins. This should be uh, what dreams are made of. <clears throat> For sure. Um, I like Benoit Saint-Denis a little bit. I'm not crazy about the line. 
and I shouldn't be even thinking about taking him because I was trying to make a case for Frivola not long ago at about a similar line. Obviously, Corey is better than Frivola by a long shot. Um, on the feet, it's definitely going to be close, but I just don't know if Corey's got another war in him. You know what I mean? It's like a little bit much. This guy's such an animal. He's got the grappling upside like so big time. And I think, you know, he's more durable as well. Dustin's just old. He's getting too old for this game. It's going to have to hang him up soon. And why are you fighting these kind of wars at this age? Gaethje and then this at 35 years old? Like, I don't know, man. Uh, I don't know. I, I want to say St. Denis runs through him. But I can't say that no one really runs through him. So, I don't know. Um, St. Denis definitely can outgrapple him. On the feet, it's going to be pretty close. But the pressure is coming from St. Denis for sure. And Corey is just not very good when he's backing up. Um, and I don't think he's going to be able to stop a takedown. So give me the younger, uh, the younger, crazier guy. And I don't love the minus 200, but I think it's justified. Uh, how about you, Mason? Yeah, this one breaks my heart. I'm a huge Dustin Poirier fan. Um, definitely feels like retirement is here, at least on the horizon. I don't know if uh, it's necessarily this one or not, but I could see him maybe wanting to hang him up or kind of transition into coaching more if he gets like back-to-back -back pretty bad knockout finishes um, or losses, I guess. Uh, it, it is a step up in competition for Benoit. Um, haven't really got to see him fight a ton against like South Paul for South Paul matchups. I think that might be a little tricky for him. One of his best moves is that uh, lead body kick. South Paul for South Paul kind of negates that a bit. But yeah, I mean, he's definitely going to be just full balls to the wall coming forward, putting the pressure on. And I mean, if, if Dustin survives the initial onslaught, I think this gets real interesting rounds two, three, four, and five, because this is a five round uh, co-main, but which thank God, I hope it doesn't end early because this fight is fucking sweet, but yeah, it's, it's tough to get back. I mean, I, I can tell you this much. I'm not going to bet against my boy, but uh, I also don't think I'm going to be getting on the dog shot. This line stretches out more and I can get Dustin like plus 220. I'll probably take the uh the loyalty stab there, but yeah, this is one of those younger, hungrier new guard versus old guard kind of matchups and those have not been going the way of the Wiley vet here for quite a while and I can see it playing out that way again, but yeah, this this is what dreams are made of. This is a hell of a good fight. Yeah, I think this is going to be a great fight while, while it lasts. I wouldn't be shocked to see either guy get a finish here. Um, I think the line's off, though. Um, I guess I'll start with, I do think St. Denis wins. He's, I think the size difference is going to be big in this fight, too. It only says he's two inches bigger, but Benoit St. Denis came in on short notice um, and fought up at 170, while Dustin Poirier used to fight at 145. Um, so I think there is going to be a size difference. Poirier is getting slower and older. Benoit St. Denis is 28 and only getting better every fight. At the same time, I think you have to be nuts almost to bet Benoit St. Denis' current number. Um, this is a guy who, less than a calendar year ago, was a plus 250, plus 300 dog against one of the Bonfim brothers. And we're betting at minus 200 against a former title contender and interim champion. Like, that seems kind of nuts to me. Also, um, if you go back and watch the – even – as more recently in the Thiago Moises fight, Thiago Moises landed some huge bombs on him. And yes, he's a dog and bit through it, but Thiago Moises is a BJJ guy. Like his strike is okay, but like Dustin Poirier hits a whole lot harder. And if you, is one of those guys who's going to bite down his mouthpiece and throw and Poirier lands, it wouldn't shock me at all. Poirier puts his lights out. Um, and Poirier's also one of those guys when, his, when, when he's in these fights, his back against the wall, I feel like he performs at his best. Look like at people doubt him. We go back to that Dan Hooker fight. That's when he fought great in that fight and came back like a dog. I was talking to shit after both Conor McGregor fights. Um, Poirier was just a favorite to both Justin Gaethje and Charles Oliveira and then beat Michael Chandler. And all of a sudden, like, 
I mean, no, no disrespect by this. Benoit, Benoit Saint Denis may get to that level, may be a future champion, but we're talking about current resumes. He's probably a step down in competition for Poirier as far as rankings go currently. Um, I just feel like the line has to be off. Um, and you can go back even further for Benoit Saint Denis, the, the Zalecki Dos Santos fight. He took a life changing amount of damage in that fight and got destroyed. Like, and Poirier is a way better striker than him. Um, I don't know. I do, I do think Benoit Saint Denis wins, but the people that have Max Bagum and saying it's an easy fight, I think it's tough to say that. I think it is a good matchup for Benoit Saint Denis because of the side different size differential and the way they fight are similar. With Poirier getting worse, Benoit Saint Denis getting better. Like you think the young dog should win? I just feel like this should be a line closer. Like Benoit Saint Denis, like minus one twenty five, minus one thirty, not minus two hundred. Um, in saying that, my rushing to bet Poirier, no, not really, because I do think he loses. But I may take a – he's kind of like another Pedro Munoz for me. Like, I wouldn't shock me at all if on my card on Friday I have him a small dog shot on him. And I'm probably going to be on an island there because it seems like all of Twitter loves Benoit saint Denis, but that might be a good thing. Main event time. I thought you didn't talk about it. Want me to dive into it? Didn't I start um, that one? <laughs> yeah. They started it off. Oh, yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it's late. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so on to the main event of the evening, we got Sean Sugar, Sean O'Malley taking on Marlo Chito Vera. Um, yeah, I like O'Malley pretty big here. Um, a few reasons being, I feel like the line's down in this fight because of how their last fight finished, where Chito Vera won with those leg kicks and hurting Sean O'Malley's leg and getting on top position and winning the fight. Um, but even going back on that fight four years ago, um, O'Malley was like a minus 300, minus 350 favorite. Um now, both of them getting a little better, more experience. Um, I feel like O'Malley did beat Peter Jan in that fight. He won rounds one and three. And other people argue that, but he did. Um, he slept Aljamain Sterling. His striking is more precise than Chio Vera. I feel like he's a better striker than Vera. Vera doesn't put stamps on rounds, comes off really passive. Um, I feel like O'Malley is a more precise striker of the two. Um, I feel like it's just a tailor made matchup for, you know, Chito Vera for, a, or not Chito Vera, for Sugar Sean O'Malley for his first title defense. Um, instead of giving him another grappler who can test him there, like Marab, give him a guy who's a low volume power striker from the outside who, you know, if he throws power, O'Malley can catch him on a counter perfectly. And O'Malley's a longer guy where he can land where Cheeto can't. Um, although Cheeto's reach isn't that much smaller than O'Malley's, um, I still think O'Malley's a better striker and it's going to be a striking fight. Like, sure, if he gets hurt by leg kicks again, that's variance. Fuck it happens, right? Um, but I feel like this line should be even wider. I agree. Um, generally speaking, there's value on a challenger in a title fight. Um, there's not a whole lot of defending titles that happens these days, aside from the, a few guys that tend to hold their belts. Usually they're giving them away, but I don't understand why there is getting a title shot other than it's just an easy win for O'Malley. He doesn't deserve a title Hagen. shot. Yeah, Sandhagen smoke shot. way better. Uh, so you're going to beat Pedro Munoz on a one-fight winning streak, and you're going to get a title shot? Like, what's going on here? Um, yeah, I don't think Marlon's that good. He's a slow starter. He's low volume. Um, John's just a way, way better striker, and I think he's going to be better at jiu-jitsu. Uh, no matter where this fight takes place, I think Sean's excessively more talented. Um, volume wise, it's not even close. Sean Lance almost double. So, um, I just find it hard to believe that Vera can win three rounds on a scorecard, and I don't really think he's going to knock him out. So, to me, this is just a tailor made matchup. It's one that doesn't make sense, and the ones that don't make sense always happen for a reason. Uh, we mentioned it earlier. I talked about Daniel Cormier defending his title um, against Derek Lewis, who did not deserve a title shot. It was a tailor-made matchup for a title defense, and that's what's happening here. So, um, yeah, O'Malley, I think he should be more like minus 700. Maybe that sounds absolutely stupid, but I don't think Farrah's even a top five guy. Um, I don't think he's a top 10 guy. <laughs> Am I crazy? I don't know. Like, I think Sandhagen's better. I think Yan's better. I think Rob Font's better. I had money on Rob Font that night, and, you know, if his chin didn't get destroyed late... Uh, Rob outstruck him by like over 100 strikes. 
So it's kind of hard to win fights like that. Like, he's not going to knock Sean down three times and steal it. He was losing to Frank Yeager until he wasn't, too. Yeah, and that's that's embarrassing at that age, you know? Um, Aljo's better. Like, everyone's better. Is Marlon even barely in the top ten? It doesn't make sense. So uh, O'Malley's going to kill him. Probably get a highlight reel finish. Yeah. It's totally tailor made. So let's get on to uh, why the people are here. Oh, uh, I don't have much to add. I oh, sorry, Mace, but... No, you're a good. I fully agree. Um, my only thing is, I'd probably be looking more at O'Malley decision than an O'Malley finish. But uh, yeah, no, he's clearly the side in my opinion too. All right, the proper, proper. My leg's probably gonna be O'Malley. I feel like he's the side I'm most confident in. All right. Help yourself, Mason. Man, I want to kind of want to be crazy and take one of these like minus 120s that I love. Um, also, like that Robellus guy, if one of you wants O'Malley. That's pain. I'm pretty confident in him as well. But I got something else up my sleeve that you guys aren't going to touch. I was yeah, almost like guessing that. it was the Chikagian Barber over for you, Dave. Yeah, it has yeah. to be. It's just like a minus 800. Uh, well, I mean, we can get Rebellious in and be like a plus 125. Or we can go the uh, like the Jailton Peter Yan round, get it over plus two hundred. What's that with the Spain? Uh, plus one twenty five. Yep, I actually really like the Rubellus O'Malley and Chuk over. To me, sounds like it should be a large. Yeah, well, that's that's a proper. I think that's a good proper. one. What do we got? Plus one twenty. One twenty five. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that's it. That's the play. I like it. We cashed last week, and I forgot we moved to. We're up uh, two. Let me load I think it. We are, it. Um, we are 15 and 9 15 plus 11.72 units. All time on the proper. Uh, not bad. We need to be better, though. So let's win this one and uh, give the people what they want. Use a couple extra bucks and. Sounds good. It's been funny. Okay. Well, boys, it's a pleasure. See you guys really? next week. See you all next week. Have fun watching UFC 299. Hell yeah.